Welcome to you, Pastor George Grace. You just can't take anything serious, can you? You know you've hurt my feelings, and then at the beginning of the service tonight, you just step on the top of my head. You just crush me. But anyway, I am so glad to be here. You have a wonderful, wonderful pastor. You really do. He is, he's the right kind of guy. He's serious when he needs to be serious, but he's got a great sense of humor. He can look at things from both sides of life. He can look at them from the serious side, but then every now and then you have to stop and smile. We have to smile at one another. We can't take ourselves too seriously, if you know what I mean, but uh, I love Pastor Mark. He's just such a blessing and such a great friend over all these years since you left your shorts in my kitchen back in let's see, 17, uh, 39 years ago. 39, I'm not going to tell everybody. There's, there's people in the Bible Institute that know, know the story, and I would uh, strongly encourage those of you that know the story to share it with other members of the congregation. So we, it, the thing is, I still have his shorts. They're in my basement, and uh, with a, um, the chair that he left them on, it, we've, we've, it's, we've kind of built a shrine around it in our basement, you know, Little did we realize when you left your shorts there that, you know, how, uh, how far you would go in serving the Lord, you know, and uh, we're just, we're just, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll never get rid of that chair. We really won't. We'll never get rid of it. Wow, it's wonderful to be here. You people are great. It's Tuesday night. Look at all the people that are here, and I know there's a lot of people that aren't in here right now because there's much going on here. There's lots of children, people who are servicing the congregation so that you can come in here and you can relax and listen to what is being said and what is being sung and uh, all of that. We need to, just for a moment, would you do this? We, we need not take those people for granted would you think about maybe one of them right now that you know? Maybe they're not caring for your child or what, but you know somebody that's out and about right now or even in this room, your sight, your sound people. And before you go home tonight, think right now with me, covenant with the Lord that you will thank somebody for being here and making this a great conference so you could be comfortable, so you could see, you could hear, you could get what God wants for you during this conference. It's so, so important to have great volunteers in a church because we all ultimately benefit and prosper from that. I certainly want to thank the praise band. I know when I get here, I got here at, uh, before about 6 o'clock this afternoon, they were practicing then. They were practicing right up until moments before we started the service, and they were doing that last night. And uh, I don't know how many other hours they spent going through all of this music. But thank you, Praise Band, for your contribution in, in um, leading us in worship. It's such an important part of our services. God certainly has called us to worship. There's so many people, but um, thank you for a comfortable place to stay. And um, thank you for just your warm warmth to me. You've made me feel so welcome here and uh, I really do feel like I'm home and over the years there's a few churches that I feel that way uh, it's because of the people in the church they're warm they're friendly they're encouraging that I'm praying for you or I enjoyed what you said or it really helped whatever it is but that goes a long way to help anybody to encourage anybody it goes a long way to make a person's day something you say to someone before you go home or before the end of the day, may take a day that was just the pits all day long, because you say something, it can turn that thing right around, and when they go to sleep, when they uh, put their head on their pillow tonight, they'll say, you know, today was a good day. You could change everything for them. Think about that. We do have a tendency to think pretty much of ourselves, do we not? Well, anyway, we uh, started our, our series of messages on Sunday morning with a question from Song of Solomon. And if I can paraphrase it, 
what's so great about your husband? Or, for our purposes, what's really so great about Jesus? And of course, uh, Solomon's bride, the Shulamite, she said that she was sick of love. And, you know, we can take that, really turn that around. She was lovesick. She was overwhelmed with affection and, uh, and her feelings toward her husband to the degree, and I think many of us, if not all of us, can understand that, where uh, so much of herself was focused on attention towards her husband that uh, it almost made, you, you get a feeling in your stomach like, I might even throw up, you know, because of it. And that's not a bad thing. It's just a good thing. You're so consumed with someone else. And um, we see that in this lady. What's so great about your husband? So we tried to answer that question as it applied, of course, to our husband. We're the church, the bride. Our husband, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we, we talked about Song of Solomon, tried to establish some context for that, and because it's not often preached on, I wanted to say some, bring some facts forward about it so people really could understand at least the direction that that fifth chapter of the Song of Solomon was going, so you wouldn't be too confused with it. We then went to the book of Hebrews, and we kind of took a survey Sunday morning, and then last night we took a survey through the book of Hebrews, a book that was uh, designed specifically to uplift the Lord Jesus Christ, directed at the Jews primarily to convince them that Jesus was their Messiah. Those who were kind of on the verge of conversion and they were considering and they were thinking of the pros and the cons and what he did and what they expected and all of that, the author of the book of Hebrews is trying to get them over the top so they come to faith in their Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that, that book is all about the better things, the best things, the superiority of Christ over angels, over Moses, over the prophets, over Aaron, etc., etc. And then over the Levitical, the new covenant, over the old covenant. And of course, the whole idea of putting faith uh, in Christ. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And so that book ends telling us how important it is to have faith in reality, in the reality of the Messiah. And of course, that's where the author was taking them to come to make a decision to trust Christ as Savior. Then last night, we finished up with a list of, of uh, statements uh, that I put together and passages that teach the divinity of Christ. Now, it's tough to just take one verse of Scripture and prove anything. I believe that, uh, you know, line upon line, here a little, there a little, if there's something that's true in the Bible, it's not just encapsulated only in one verse. You can find that truth in many places. So what we did last night is we gave you several different places and concepts and ideas in who Christ was to prove that he indeed is God manifest in the flesh. And of course, we built that off, off 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse uh, 16, that says, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. And of course, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Now... We're, I just want to say a couple things before we get going. Here is the verse that we used to kick off Sunday morning. But before we go any further, we mentioned, I mentioned, and I think your pastors mentioned, the notes, the PowerPoints for all of this, this QR code. You take that QR code and uh, you can get all of the notes, all of the PowerPoints from all of the messages you can, and, and you can download them and have them for yourself. So for those of you that, um, and, and my purpose was to save you from sitting there writing all night long because there's a lot of things that I wanted to put on the screen that uh, helps us be more efficient with our time and uh, for me to really do a better job to have it right out in front of you where you can see it. Not only hearing it, but seeing it, it reinforces the truth. But now you can take 
all of these slides, there's probably 50 of them by the time I'm done, maybe even more than that. But if you wanted to, you could go back and systematically go through them from the first to the last and really follow through how I've presented the, the answer to the question, what is really so great about Jesus Christ? So when we walk out of here tomorrow night, you don't have to rely totally on your memory for what has taken place these last four days. You can walk out and you can rehearse. You can go back and look at uh, the outlines, the PowerPoints, and you can reinforce those truths in your mind. You do that a few times in the next week and you won't forget them. They will become part of your intellect. So I'm encouraging you to do that if you would. So anyway, we're going to go to Colossians, if you would go with me tonight, Colossians chapter number three. Now there's a reason why I've chosen this. This is the theme verse or passage for this conference. This, uh, again, uh, Pastor Mark and I met several uh, months ago on the phone and then several weeks ago face to face in Rochester to talk about this conference and plan this and he wanted to share with me his heart for what he would like to accomplish and at that meeting he had written up some thoughts that that he had in uh, in in those thoughts was Colossians chapter number three verses one through four and of course those verses as we'll read in just a moment are very much about the Lord Jesus Christ but in his mind this was kind of the theme they're the theme passage that he wanted to take this off of so when I started praying about what I would do here this is where I started now, I know we're in our third sermon here but this is where I started and then I kind of went in both directions. This was kind of the middle of, of uh, everything that I wanted to present, but it, it goes backwards and it goes forwards both ways and I could see a logical development of a theme in doing that. So before I go any further, I'm going to pray with you. Father, we're grateful for this book, this precious book that we call the Bible. We're grateful for the passage of scripture that we're about to read. Lord, um, this is a book, like the book of Hebrews, this book is a book that maybe arguably even places a stronger emphasis on the superiority, on the preeminence of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Certainly between those two books, the book of Hebrews and the book of Colossians, those two books say so much about our precious Savior. So I'm asking you to still our hearts, our minds, to open our hearts, to be willing to receive and to have a desire to take what we hear and to move ourselves, and with the power of the Holy Spirit, move ourselves forward in our relationship with you. And I ask this in Jesus' name, for his sake, amen. So Colossians chapter number three. Before we read, we're jumping into a new book now. The theme of the book is the preeminence of Jesus Christ. That's what Colossians is all about. Just like the book of Hebrews was about the superiority of Jesus Christ over the prophets and the angels and Moses and Aaron and the covenants and the tabernacle and all of that stuff, this book is much more of a New Testament type book in the sense that Paul is the author of this, and this is directed at a Gentile church. Certainly it had Jewish people in the church, but this is the kind of book that was written that is going to uh, go into the world and people are going to grab uh, memory verses and principles and truths from this book that are really strong New Testament uh, principles, and particularly about the preeminence of Christ. Uh, it's a book that's Christ-centered, maybe arguably the most Christ-centered in all of the New Testament. And there is a verse in Colossians chapter 2, before we get into chapter 3, and if you want to just look across the page, chapter 2, verse 10, says this, And ye are complete in him. Ye are complete in him. And that kind of sums up much of what is said in this book. What Paul is saying is you really don't need anything or anybody else other than Jesus Christ. So going back to Song of Solomon 5, 9, 
What is so hot about Jesus? What is so great about Jesus? Well, frankly, ye, Christian people, are complete. You have everything you need as a Christian to be successful. You are complete in him. You understand? You are complete in him. Now, there's four chapters in the book. The book is kind of divided in half, where the first two chapters talk about the supremacy of Christ, and then the last two chapters speak of our submission to Christ. It's uh, basically, the first two chapters are very doctrinal, and that doesn't mean there's no doctrine in three or four, but we're getting biblical, we're getting theology and principles in the first two chapters, and then in the uh, cha third chapter and fourth chapter, we're getting the practical implications of the theology that has been taught in the first two chapters. Very logically organized book. Now, Christ in Colossians is a lot of things. I said, arguably, it is uh, uh, the most the, the, the book in the New Testament that exalts the Lord Jesus Christ more than any other. Hebrews would be its primary competition. But it says in Colossians that Jesus is the head of all principalities and powers. So what's so hot about them? Put that in your pipe and smoke it, all right? He's the head of all principalities and power. He is the Lord of creation, chapter 1, verse 16. He is the author of reconciliation, chapter 1, verse 20 through 22. He is the basis of the believer's hope, uh, chapter 1, verse 5, 23 and 27. He is the source of the believer's power, chapter 1, verse 11 and 29. He is the believer's redeemer and reconciler, uh, reconciler excuse me, in chapter 1, verse 14 and 20. He's the embodiment of God, chapter 1. He's the head of the church, 118. He's the resurrected God-man, 3, verse 1. And he is the all-sufficient Savior. You, he, you are complete in him. Chapter 1, verse 28. Chapter 2, verse 3, verse 10. Chapter 3, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. And that's where we are tonight. Now you say, why'd you go so fast? I want... I just wanted to do this. You don't have to write all that down. This is how you, can, you, how you can get what I just gave you. Read the book. Everything I said is in the book of Colossians. So it does, it's only four chapters long. Say, man, I wish I, had, I wish it went slower so I could get the notes. Take your own notes. Get a pen and paper out and sit in... Who is Jesus Christ in Colossians? You start writing that down. It will me mean much more to you by you doing what I just did than me doing it for you. You understand that? Now, it's good to have great Bible teachers, whether they're on radio or television or on some kind of video or a pastor like uh, Pastor Brown. It's great to have those people, but you shouldn't have to rely on some other person to feed you all the time. Even children grow up. I've got a two-year-old grandson. I love watching him eat. Half of the food goes on his face and half of the food... But you know what? He's going to get to be three or four years old and most of the food is going to go in his mouth. I, that's where I am. Most of the food goes in my mouth and I'm 75 years old. I still have a little bit here, there, and everywhere, but most of it goes in... You get in the Bible and most of that food will go in your mouth. You don't need to be spoon-fed all the time. Get, get it yourself. Get it. Be an aggressive Bible student. You people that are in the ap apologetics class, God bless you for doing something more with your time in saying, I want to learn more than I know. I want to be better than I am. Amen. Do you have a desire to be better than you are? Remember, I asked that question because you're going to hear it again tomorrow night. Well, anyway, we're in the book of Colossians, our submission in Christ. So let's Let's see what we've got on our slides here. Colossians chapter number 3. Let's read. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. 
For you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, I love this phrase, who is our life? What a statement that is. He is your life. Christ is our life. How can we neglect him? How can we ignore him? He is what life is all about. He is what this book is all about. It's the person of Christ. Anything of any importance in this world has something to do with Jesus Christ. There's a lot of things that we pay a lot of attention to, a lot of time with, spend a lot of money on, that has little or nothing to do with Jesus. Think about that. You know what stewardship is, don't you? You and I don't own anything. We're supposed to be stewards with what God has given to us because someday he's going to ask us to give an account for what he's given us to use for his honor and glory. So everything we do in our time, in, in our conversations with people, ultimately our spending habits, they ought to consider biblical stewardship. What would God think of this? By the way, we read the book of Proverbs. It has all kinds of passages in it in how to use and spend and guard your money. Well, anyway, we've read the text. What should we seek above, all right? Here are some things that I've written down. I've had to sit down. That's quite a statement. Seek those things which above. I've been in uh, classes, in fact, teaching this particular a book, and coming to this point, I said, okay, it says to set your affection on things above. Class, tell me some things that are above that we're supposed to set our affection on. Now, I'm giving you the, some answers to this. I'm not going to say this is a, an exhaustive list, but it's a pretty good list. What's in heaven? The throne of God, where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. Revelation chapter 4 says, quote, And immediately I, this is John, was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So if we're supposed to set our affection on things above, one thing we ought to is the throne, which is a symbol of the authority of God in our universe and lives. Also, there's the new Jerusalem. Galatians chapter 4, verse 26 says, But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Hebrews chapter 12 says, But ye are come unto Mount Sion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. And then in Revelation chapter 21, we see that new Jerusalem show up, 21-2. And I, John saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. The Bible says that Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. You remember that? Isn't that in the book of Hebrews, I think? Maybe Hebrews chapter 11, that great faith chapter. If it isn't, it's in the Bible. I do know that. He looked for a city whose builder and maker was God, but he never found that here. You know what city he was looking for? He's looking for this one right here, the new Jerusalem. Set your affection on things above. How about departed loved ones? You have someone? Do you have someone that has passed away that you love and you are reasonably assured that they are with the Lord themselves? And I know we all have, we know people we have some doubts about. Don't focus on them. It's not up to you to decide whether or not people go to heaven or not. It's, you know, I certainly want to witness to people and I want to share the gospel, but ultimately God is the one that really knows who is saved and who is not. And don't worry, he doesn't get confused like you and I. And he probably doesn't have exactly some of the standards that we have. That is, when we look at someone, we say, well, you know, they don't act like they're saved, so we discount them. God probably doesn't look at the things that way. He looks at the heart. Remember, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. 
God looks down deep into your heart and he sees genuine faith. That's what he's looking for. He's looking for genuine belief. How about departed loved ones? You know, I've lost my father, my mother, my wife's father and mother. My wife has lost three siblings. She's one of nine children. Three of her, obviously two brothers and one sister have gone on. You know, and you kind of long for people like that. But like Brother, Brother Mike, Brother Mike lost his wife some time ago. And uh, it could be if you've been around any length of time, you've lost someone really near and dear to you, and they're in heaven, and you're looking for it. And we do this all the time at funerals. We talk about the day will come when we get to see them once again. That's one of the high points of any funeral I ever do, is, you know what, I can give you hope. If you're a Christian, I can give you hope. Not only that you're going to go to heaven yourself, but you know all your loved ones, people that you've respected, people you've loved and they've gone on before you, you're going to see them again. There's something comforting about that. Something greatly comforting about that. Well, what else? You've got Christ. You've got rewards. You've got Uh, eternal truths of the word and we could comment and give you verses on each and every one of them but these are things that we know are in heaven and we should set our affection on we should love the authority the throne of god the new jerusalem departed saints christ himself the rewards in in heaven that that are those uh for those who have served the lord faithfully and of course the eternal truths of the word Well, that's verses 1 and 2 of this. Verses 3 and 4 answer this question. Why should we seek them? For ye are dead, the Bible says, Colossians chapter 3, verse 3, for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. So why should we seek these things that are above? There's five reasons in the text. Now, I'm not coming up with just reasons off the top of my head that I could probably think up some others, but I want to draw the reasons that are actually in the text that we're reading because this was written by the Holy Spirit of God And as far as God is concerned, these are the things that are most important in answering the questions that are asked. Sometimes we ask questions and we're looking for a different answer. And although the answer is given right there in the Bible, we're looking for something else. Remember the answers in the Bible are the answers that God has placed in the Bible and they are important to him. And once again, we need to align our thinking with his thinking. So there's five reasons seen here why we should set our affection on things above. Number one, 3.3 3 says that we're dead with Christ. Number two, we are raised with Christ. We are hidden with Christ, verse 3.3. 3. We live in Christ, 3.4, and we are glorified in Christ, 3.4. So here's some reasons why we should set our affection or affections on things above. What are your affections set on? What's important to you? Now, we're all carnal. We all have a disease. I call it stuffitis. Stuff. We like stuff. Things. Materialism. Material goods. Now, that's one thing. That's not the only thing, but maybe money is the best representation of stuffitis because when you got money, you can buy anything. How about if you looked at money and you looked at God and be, were honest with yourself, which of those two things are more important to you? Money? stuff, material goods. I know I'm talking to Christians. Or God. Now, by the way, I have to ask myself that question. I'm, a, I'm very human. Every now and then, my wife reminds me that I'm carnal. 
That's a way of getting even with me when I'm slipping a little bit, you know? What's more important to you? Now, let me ask you this. We're t- I know we've got a, we're going to uh, have commitments for missions. What's more important to you? Giving to God's program or keeping all the money for yourself? Now, I don't know how much money you have. I don't care how much money you have. But God does. He knows how much money you have. And he cares about how you use it. It's called stewardship. Set your affection on things above, the Bible says, and not on the things of this earth. Well, anyway, we got five good reasons there in verses 3 and 4 why we should set our affection on things above. Let's continue on, though. Verses 5 through 9 say this. Put off the old man. Do you see that? Put off the old man in this sense. Mortify. That means kill. A mortuary is a place where dead people live. I'm mortified with what you said. You've killed me with what you said. Mortuary. Mortified. Mortify. Kill, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Actually, we could say it this way. Reckon yourselves, this is how Romans says it, reckon yourselves to be dead unto sin and alive unto God. So what we have to do when we're dealing with the temptation to set our affection on things other than things above is we need to kill ourselves. We need to deal with our flesh and our desires and say, stop, I need to set my affection on things above first before I set my affection or my love on things that are physical and maybe make me feel good. Put off the old man in verses 5 through 9. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. And here's a list. See if you can identify. Fornication. Kill it. Uncleanness. Inordinate affection. Evil concupiscence. And covetousness. Now, I know what some of you are saying. You're saying, you know what? I have no idea what any of those words mean, so I must be safe. Now, I'm going to define them for you here in just a moment so you know what they mean, all right? There's five of them right there in that passage. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate, out of the ordinary, extraordinary affection. That's inordinate. Evil concupiscence. How about the word lust? Do you understand what that means instead of concupiscence? And covetousness. That means I'm sick because I want to have something for myself and I can't have it. And we're talking about materialism. Which is covetousness. When's the last time you heard a sermon on covetousness is idolatry? And And I'm not saying that about your pastor he's probably quoted that and he certainly understands that but boy telling americans that covetousness is idolatry man we're all guilty let's come to the altar folks we see so much stuff that we want to the point where we sacrifice sometimes sacrifice our family sacrifice our morality sacrifice our relationship with family members, sacrifice our relationship with God to get what we want for ourselves. Put off the old man. Covetousness is idolatry. And then it continues. It says, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Did you hear that? Those sins create or bring the wrath of God on the children of disobedience, in the which ye, Colossians, also walk sometimes. You too. Me too. You walked that way. That's how you lived your life. You lived your life, you fornicator, you idolater, you lustful individual, you covetous person. That's how you used to live. 
Now, that's taking something for granted that you don't live that way anymore. Do you? It says, put it off. Do you see yourself in that list anywhere? Something that you could make yourself or by the power of God in your life, make yourself a better person than you are? It says then, in verse 8, but now ye also put off all these. He's not done with his list. He's already given you five, but if you weren't guilty of any of them, let's try these on for size. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Blah. What comes out here is generally what's in here. Out of the abundance of the heart. That's a biblical truth, by the way. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. When you hear somebody using crude, crass language, blasphemous language, they have an evil, wicked heart. You say, Pastor Grace, you're judging them. No, I'm just telling you that's what the Bible says. The Bible says you can find out what a person is like by listening to what they talk about. What do you talk about? What do I talk about? We need to stop and examine ourselves. Put off the old man. And then he says in verse 9, lie not to one another. He's talking to the church. The Christian's lying to one another. Misrepresenting something? I don't really know. But lie not to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. So if Jesus is such a great an incredibly superior, preeminent individual, what Paul is saying, it ought to bring about your love for him, setting affections on him, he was one of the six things, should bring about a very drastic change in your life. And we know that. We know that as Christians. It should bring about a drastic change. The old man, the new man. Put off the old man and put on the new man. Let me define the list of sexual sins that we've mentioned. Fornication. That's sexual sin in general. Uncleanness is defined as a filthy mind, filthy thoughts, filthy humor, perverted fantasies, Pornography in literature and in movies. Get rid of it. You're not honoring the Savior if you hang on to that stuff. Kill it. Mortify it. Ephesians chapter 4 says that lost men walk, quote, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, have given themselves over to lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. In other words, Paul in Ephesians is, is saying, you see this list of things you're supposed to put off? That's how lost people live. By the way, you shouldn't expect much different from them. They're lost. But from Christian people, we ought to expect better because we set our affection on things above and not on the things of this earth. So there's sexual sins. That's the first of the first five of 11 of them that are listed right there. Boy, we're living in a time like that. I mean, sex sells, folks. It's everywhere around us. It's very difficult. I, I can't imagine being a 14 or 15-year-old boy today going to school and some of the stuff that people wear and trying to keep thinking about algebra or chemistry or history or whatnot. Life for kids today is 18 hours of sex education every day. And they're not being taught by good teachers about sex education. We live in a very
very corrupt society today. How about personal attitude sins? That's the second list. Anger, wrath, etc., etc. What is anger? Indignation, fury, wrath, loss of temper, uncontrolled rage, malice, moral badness, ill will, holding grudges, blasphemy, speaking in a, se in a sense that we would injure the name of God or someone else, filthy communication, disgraceful speech, low, obscene, full of sexual innuendos. Before I was in the ministry, I worked at Eastman Kodak Company. I think I mentioned that Sunday morning. The language there. Now, I was de I probably half the people that I worked with had earned doctorate degrees from accredited universities, Purdue, MIT. These were intelligent, educated individuals. But the language among the people, it's like, Gutter language among people like that. Sexual innuendos constantly and talking about the secretaries, the secretarial pool and just, no, I was lost. I was part of that. But when I got saved and I was working at Kodak when I got saved, therefore if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, things began to change for me. And I looked at those conversations and that language through a different pair of eyes. And I thought, how filthy we are as men talking like this about these women. If they knew, now, I don't know if it's like that where you work. I hope that it isn't. But there are a lot of places like it. And I know there's a lot of laws that have come out to try to stem the tide of all that. And uh, it's probably worked to some degree. Filthy communication. And then sin that's aimed at fellow believers in chapter 3, verse 9, talks about um, lying not to one another. I don't know if I'm keeping up here, but I've got the sexual sins, the personal attitude sins, the sins against one another. Yeah, we're on the, the right path here. Now, what am I saying all of this for? This is kind of a... This is kind of a typical Baptist sermon. This is the kind of sermon that if you were going to a church you had never been in and you walked into that church and the preacher got up, he's picked out a list of sins and he's going to condemn them. And, you know, you kind of walk out not edified. You've been, you know, you've heard this before. I'm not supposed to do this and I'm not supposed to do that. It sounds like my parents. But I want you to remember I want you to remember this is the third message in the series. The first two messages are the reasons why we're not supposed to do these things. Because we're to hold in high esteem and preeminence the Lord Jesus Christ. Because there's something about him that's really great. What is it? What is it about your husband, lady, that you want us to go out in the community and and tell everybody that you're lovesick and you want to see your husband. Why? Remember, that's where we started. Now we're talking about the negative side or the negative side of behaviors when we're not showing our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a required message in a series like this. We can get up here and we can extol the preeminence and the virtues of Christ and the character of Christ. We can do that. And you can walk out of here and feel good. But I'll promise you, I said something here tonight that didn't make you feel good. In case you missed it, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication, lying to one another, sexual sin, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate, extraordinary, out of the ordinary affection, evil lust and concupiscence, covetousness. Get rid of it because he's worth it. Clean things up in your life by the power of the Holy Spirit. Put off, put on, 
in the book of Ephesians says, and put away. And many of the things that we're looking at here in Colossians are in that list in Ephesians. Okay, we're almost done. Put on the new man. Now, this is the positive part of the message. Those are the things that we need to shed, we need to get rid of. But we're to put on the new man in Jesus Christ. Let's go back to verse number 10 in this chapter. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Whether there is neither, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, this is what we're supposed to do. Put off all that, it's like an analogy, all that, that fornication clothing, uncleanness clothing, the blasphemy clothing, that dirty filthy stuff that you wore remember when you were lost put it off now this is what you're supposed to put on this is the new clothing that we're supposed to put on as christians put on therefore verse 12 is the elect of god holy and beloved this is it bowels of mercies now this is how we're supposed to behave ourselves by the way i commend you i see it everywhere in here coming in here i feel safe and I'm, that's not a joke. I feel safe. Why do I feel safe? I feel safe because I see how you deal with one another. There is genuine love in this church body. It's being expressed. Smiles on people's faces. People serving one another. People greeting one another. That's a good thing. That will attract other people to your church congregation and fellowship just because people can come in here and feel safe and feel safe with their children. We're living in a different day, you know, aren't we? It's a safe place for their kids also. This is what we're supposed to put on. These are the things that are, we call them the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. Different words are used for these characteristics here in this list. So what do we see here in verse number 12? Bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. That means you suffer long. You put up with people. Forbearing. That's what forbearing means. You put up with people. Forbearing one another forgiving one another and if any man have a quarrel against any even as christ forgave you so also do ye there shouldn't be any grudges in here somebody's offended you surely someone's offended you in this church with all these people get on with your life forgive them don't allow that incident that feeling that you have towards that individual destroy your spirituality and your relationship with Christ. It isn't worth it. You know, when you don't forgive someone else, you're the one that pays the price for that. They don't even know that you didn't forgive them. You don't talk to them. As far as they're concerned, that's okay. You don't have to talk to them. You have to talk to everybody. But when you're eaten up, because you are, have a grudge against somebody who's offended you, you're the one who pays the price. Get rid of that. Go forward in an invitation and dump it at the altar. Get rid of it. I don't want to dislike... It. Now, there's things I don't like in this world, but I don't want to have any enemies. I want to be able to go in any grocery store or Walmart or whatnot and walk up and down any aisle and not worry about who I run into. Oh, there's so-and-so. I need to go over here. I don't, want to, I don't want to talk to those people. I don't want to go anywhere where I'm afraid to talk to anybody. That's what I want to do. That's my desire. I'd like to accomplish that. No grudges. No holding people accountable for what they did 25 years ago to you. I'll never forgive those people for what they did to me. 
humbleness of mind, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. And if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. This is the foundation for forgiving other people. I am a sinful wretch. I know how much of a sinner I am. And you know what? I am forgiven. I don't have any guilt. I'm not, I don't have to hang my head because Christ paid for my sin and I'm free in Jesus Christ. I don't, I don't have to live under that cloud of guilt. Now, I'm not proud of everything I've done and every now and then things come up and I'm saying, man, I'm glad that's over and I'm, man, I'll never do that again. My old life comes back to me every now and then. But most of the time, I'm living in liberty in Christ. That's where we want to live, in liberty in Christ. Even as Christ forgave you, you forgive people who have offended you. That's the basis for forgiveness. And then I like for, verse 14. There's much to say in here, but I'm going to end in verse 14. And above all things, put on charity which is the bond of perfectness. Charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Now, the Bible says there's three great things in 1 Corinthians. Faith, hope, and charity. Faith, hope, and charity. Faith, hope, and charity. How do they relate to one another? Now, bear with me. You may not agree with what I say, but I think there's some substance to what I'm going to say. All right, I'm going to turn around, and uh, this is going to be past... This is going to be present, and this is going to be future. Faith, hope, and charity, okay? Faith has to do much with the past. Hope has much to do with the future, and charity has much to do with the present. Follow me now. This is why they're so great. How do we get faith? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So those three things, faith, hope, and charity, faith is one of the three greatest things. That is my belief, my trust in God based on what I know about him from God's word. That's past. That's important. But my past is important. I got 50 years in Christianity of reading my Bible and teaching and preaching and trying to live this thing out. That helps me right now as a Christian. I have a track record, and hopefully much of it is very good. Faith, what I believe today. Hope, hope has to do with the future. My hope is in Christ. My hope is in the resurrection. My hope is in dying and going to heaven. These things have been written unto you that believe upon the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Christ is our hope in glory. He is our blessed hope. Faith is based on what I have learned and experienced in my Christian life. That's why it's important. Hope is what keeps you going day in and day out when you get discouraged. You're looking forward, whatever it is. In the secular world, you're looking forward to Friday to get a paycheck. We as Christians are looking forward to Jesus coming. That's, what we're lo- that's our hope. Charity. It's the bond of perfectness. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. Why is charity the greatest, greater than faith, greater than hope? Why charity? Because charity is who you are right now. Who you are right now, it's present you have the opportunity and you have the responsibility to exercise the bond of perfectness, charity, with one another, with your families, with your neighbors, with every person that you come in contact with. The reason why charity is the most important is it's because who you are right now. You can tell me what you were and what you've learned, And you can tell me where you're going because you have hope in it. They're important. 
But the most important thing is, who are you right now? Who are you right now? Exercising charitableness and love. God loves, but he does more than that. God is love. It's part of his character and nature. And God wants us to share in his character and nature, and he wants us to display that, the love of God in our lives, to everyone else around us. Charity is the bond of perfectness. So you want to do something to bless Jesus? Live a charitable life right now. Show the love of God to people that, in your mind, may not deserve it. That's okay. God loves people who don't deserve love all the time. Be like God. Love people who don't deserve your love. They don't deserve your affection. They don't deserve your attention. They don't deserve your generosity. They don't deserve it, but you give it to them because you want the love of God to be distributed everywhere you go. And that's why charity is the most important of faith, hope, and charity. Charity is who you are right now. Are you charitable? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, thank you. It's been good to be in your house tonight. It's been good to be with your people tonight. All said, all that has been said, and all the things that we should and should not do ought to be motivated by our love for our Savior. We're sick with love. We're lovesick, Lord. We want to tell people of your goodness. We want to share your goodness. We want to share your love with other people. Boy, that Shulamite woman, she was overwhelmed by the love of her husband. And like the Shulamite being overwhelmed, we are overwhelmed with the love of God and the love of Jesus Christ. Help us to show that every day in our lives for his honor and for his glory. In Christ's name we pray. And all the people said, amen.